now we'll take a look at the Stroop model and that will help us understand how top-down biasing might work in the prefrontal cortex. So basically we have a very, very simple small-scale model. Prefrontal cortex is two neurons. <laughs> okay, so it's just really boiling it down to its essence, somewhat like the attention model that we looked at in the perception chapter. Um, we start off by training this model uh, and we can see here that in the input we have colors and words. Um, we have uh, a pathway up here in the kind of hidden associative cortex, posterior cortex of this model that maps a individual word into its corresponding output. Uh, so this is where we actually pronounce the words red or green. So we don't ever train the model on the key conflict condition. And so it just, you know, basically does what normal people do, which is name colors and read words, have a higher frequency of word reading compared to color naming. And that's the critical difference that allows the system to build up greater strength for word reading. And so we can see this as we click on the synaptic weights. Um, here I'm looking at the receiving weights. This is into the green unit. And you can see that the pathway here with the uppercase letters, meaning kind of the word reading part, um, is getting stronger compared to what we see in the color naming. So if I just go back up here, you can see here we have the uh, word reading pathway it takes the word green in the input and maps it to the word green in the output. Um, it gets top-down input from the word reading context unit uh, or task unit in prefrontal cortex. And this is really the contribution of the prefrontal cortex, again, to hold on with active maintenance, this idea that I should be reading words. And critically, there is another unit up here for naming colors. And so every time I'm naming colors, I think about, oh, I'm naming colors, I should pay attention to the color. Um, and so that helps support processing in this uh, color naming pathway. But uh, as we can see, through the course of this frequency asymmetry, the synaptic weights get stronger for word reading because it's essentially the more automatic, more uh, kind of fluent uh, form of processing. So we train the model over uh, some number of epochs of training here, just kind of an arbitrary amount of training. Uh, and then the critical thing is when we test the model, as we've been doing, um, to look at each of those different conditions, the uh, neutral, uh, conflict and congruent cases. And here you can see the results. I can uh, kind of uh, test it again, just so you can see it run again. Um, but basically what this is showing us is that the uh, word reading pathway, as we saw in the human data, is flat, unaffected by anything happening in the color pathway. But here is this critical slowing uh, phenomenon such that when we have the conflict condition, the word red written in green ink or vice versa, um, we get this classic slowing of processing. We are also tracking errors down here and you can change the parameters so that it makes errors as well. But in this case, it's not making an error. There's enough kind of cognitive control coming down from the prefrontal cortex, but still it struggles. It really has to fight to overcome that stronger pull from the word reading pathway. And this is very much like the dynamic that we saw in the uh, attention model, that there's essentially this kind of, uh, you know, battle of inhibitory competition and excitatory uh, support going on. And so the, the color naming task top-down uh, control unit has to essentially support this weaker pathway. And even with that additional support, it still takes more time. So it's pretty intuitive that this is going to be a, a kind of slower, more effortful process. Uh, so next we can look at what happens uh, in this model as we did in our attention model if we have some kind of damage to the prefrontal cortex. And there's a number of situations where you get, you know, reduction of function in prefrontal cortex. And in cases like that, you definitely see an increased Stroop effect. And this model is fairly sensitive, so it actually doesn't take too much to reduce it, um, so we can drop this down to 0.28 uh, and uh, then run our test. And you can see right there that that uh, conflict case kind of jumped up a little bit. 
and that is exactly what we expect to see that we get an increase in reaction time as the uh, frontal cortex is getting weaker so this is less top-down control less support from the frontal cortex and uh, as we continue to do that it just gets progressively weaker uh, we can keep going at some point uh, we'll start making errors uh, but you can see we get quite a bit slower here as we reduce so you can see quite a dramatic effect on the conflict condition as we reduce the strength of that prefrontal cortex input. Okay, there it made an error. Uh, it's very hard to see the error, uh, but um, if you reduce it sufficiently, then uh, you get this tiny little you know, difference between zero and one down here. If we turn off the cycle, you can see the error exclusively, and you can see, in fact, that now it starts to make errors. The bottom line is that uh, reduced top-down support from the task representations uh, increases selectively the slowing of that conflict trial. And, and so that's really the signature phenomenon, just like we saw in the attention model where we saw that kind of invalidly cued case was selectively affected um, with brain damage. Here we see the conflict case is selectively affected. You can also look at this further test of the stimulus onset asynchrony, the SOA. We won't go into those details, but you can do that on your own.